Good morning and welcome to day two of the RIC. I trust that you enjoyed yesterday as I did. There were a lot of engaging sessions. And before I start and introduce our next plenary speaker, I really want to give a shout out to the Office of Public Affairs who's been working tirelessly following all the highlights of the RIC and posting on X, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. So thanks to our partners in the Office of Public Affairs. Let's give them a hand. And now it's my honor to introduce the next plenary speaker. The Honorable Bradley R. Crowell was sworn in as a commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on August 26, 2022, and is currently serving the remainder of a five-year term ending June 30th, 2027. Kroll has more than 20 years of experience in the fields of energy, environment, natural resources, climate change, and national security, including executive leadership positions in federal and state government. Prior to beginning his tenure as commissioner, Kroll served as director of the Nevada, I said it right, Nevada, right? A practice. Um, Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources as an Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy. Please welcome Commissioner Kroll. Good morning, everyone. I see it's a uh, full room this morning. Uh, welcome to day two of the uh, NRC's annual uh, regulatory information conference. Um, thank you, Andrea, for the um, very nice introduction. Uh, I'm honored to be here today with uh, my fellow commissioners, um, uh, past and present, and uh, all of our uh, international partners, uh, um, I'm told representing about 48 countries, and all of the other, other distinguished guests. Uh, I'm excited to collaborate with all of you as we've been doing this week and we'll continue through the end of the RIC um, under the very appropriately uh, themed theme of this year of adapting to a changing landscape. Much has changed and much is continue, continuing to change. Um, that being said, and I'm going to uh, make an attempt at humor here early in the morning, which uh, Chair Hansen knows is difficult. Um, the change I'm feeling the most since last year is the horrible time slot I received for this keynote. Because <laughs> for those of you who know me at all, I'm not a morning person. Uh, in fact, from my perspective, the only thing worse than listening to a keynote before 9 a.m. is having to give a keynote before 9 a.m. With obvious exceptions, Chair Hansen, your keynote was invigorating. <laughs> uh, uh, but if, uh, if, 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 so, Ray, John, Andrea will be talking, uh, but if, uh, uh, and now I'll, now I'll try for bad dad humor. Uh, if I'm given the early bird slot again next year, I'll be sending, um, I'll be sending my digital twin to represent me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, and then one more anecdote to set the stage here. Uh, some of us were able to, uh, at lunch yesterday, listen to some remarks from um, uh, Mike Allen, who's the head of Axios and, and Politico, and he was sharing with us um, partly his new book called a Smart Brevity, um, which I had a copy with me, but I left it down in my seat. And let me just say that uh, this keynote will break every rule in that book. Uh, it will be uh, too long and not, uh, and not, 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 it'll fail at brevity. I hope it has some elements of smart, so bear with me. Um, so the RIC, uh, this is my second time I've been at the RIC. Um, I'm now familiar with the lexicon, but when I had first heard the RIC, uh, it occurred to me that uh, it's about the least exotic name you could have for an international conference. Um, but the genericness of the name uh, belies how important this is and, and uh, how valuable the, uh, the RIC is for all of us and the, and the participants, uh, both in the US and, and around the world. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, I, uh, the, the opportunity to collaborate with uh, my colleagues and other professionals in the field is great, um, but I know there's a lot of uh, uh, young professionals and students here uh, and participating online, and uh, you know I think that's they're the most important audience for us today. Um, they're the ones who are going to 
uh, have to carry forward whatever direction we, ch we chart uh, collectively uh, for uh, civilian nuclear technologies ahead. Um, so I'll extend another uh, special welcome to our, our international partners, particularly our regulatory partners. Um, I know many of you traveled long distances to be here. Um, it is a privilege to be able to have some, uh, some time to, to talk with all of you. Um, and before I dive into my remarks, I will also, um, like my colleagues who went before me yesterday, will shamelessly plug my technical session, which is this afternoon, uh, on uh, the changing landscape of environmental reviews, another area that has been changing and continues to change significantly. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't planning to try to get in a, a quick nap uh, before the uh, uh, before that 3.45 p.m. session, uh, just so you're aware, because in addition to this time slot, the uh, lost hour for us in the U.S. Uh, earlier this week is exacerbating uh, my grumpiness today, so thank you. Um, I, I have to give a shout out to my staff, um, because without them, I couldn't do what I do, and none of us could do what we do, so um, please allow me an opportunity to do that. Um, their, their guidance and insight is essential um, and uh, for me. So uh, while she's not here today, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, recognize Jan LePre, my executive assistant. She's been with me since day one, and she is fabulous. I could not have navigated uh, the NRC uh, in, my, in my early days and weeks without her, and quite frankly, uh, it's difficult to do it without her uh, even, even today. Uh, Two others who joined my team shortly after I became a commissioner, uh, David Brown, uh, my technical assistant for materials, Maxine Keefe, um, my deputy chief and legal counsel, and then earlier this year I was fortunate to add two new members to my staff, Amy Powell as my chief of staff and uh, Boyce Travis as my reactor technical assistant. Um, I'm very proud of my team. Um, they bring their A game every day. Uh, they're committed to, to uh, public service and, and advancing the public good, and they are true professional, so I appreciate all of you for what you do. So to begin, uh, in a little bit more substance, I wanted to first share some of my perspective on why I'm honored to serve on the committee, uh, sorry, on the commission and my ex expectations that I have for the rem remainder of my term. When I was asked to serve on the commission, I immediately viewed the NRC as offering uh, a unique uh, opportunity at a crucial time to enable the safe application of civil nuclear technology <clears throat> to address some of the most challenging and pressing issues facing our country today. Logically, perhaps obviously, um, climate change and energy security quickly came to mind, uh, but there are many other uh, important policy objectives where the safe application of nuclear technologies has the potential to result in significant benefits for society, and we not, must not lose sight of those. Um, and we've talked about them this week, but there's been very much uh, exciting new developments in nuclear medicine and agriculture, just to name a few. Um, these uh, could be game-changing applications and uh, are, are as important as anything else we do at the agency. So as a lifelong public servant, I've always viewed my role uh, and responsibility to be mindful uh, of both the specific mission of an agency as well as how a given agency's mission fits into the bigger picture of government's overarching responsibility to advance the public good. At the federal level, in my view, every agency, no matter how big or small, whether a cabinet department or an independent agency, shares in the collective responsibility to the American people for whom we ultimately serve. And we must, and we must execute this duty with our eyes wide open. So what does that mean uh, for the NRC and how do we get there? Uh, as uh, my colleague Commissioner Caputo uh, mentioned yesterday, um, time's of the essence. I think we all know that. Uh, we're a little bit at an hour never moment. Um, but first, I believe on the, on the reactor side, we've got to ensure that the current fleet of nuclear reactors in the U.S. can continue to meet our public health, safety, and security standards. And we must do so in the context of an increasingly complex geopolitical environment and while adapting to the rapidly uh, accelerating impacts of climate change. Uh, unfortunately, the um, climate change is intensifying. The impacts are becoming uh, more frequent and unpredictable, um, and they're affecting our entire energy system. Uh, that's our, from generation to transmission to distribution. Um, and these are uh, things we will have to deal with in the uh, near and medium, medium term uh, no matter what we do on bending the curve, uh, the, the carbon curve through 2050. So uh, for nuclear, that means we need to take seriously and uh, prepare for 
um, uh, you know, unexpected impacts from climate change and perhaps uh, other natural hazards. So, uh, just as we must ensure the integrity of our, our current fleet, um, uh, you know, in, particularly in the, concept, in the, in the context of uh, nuclear safety and climate resilience being, being linked, um, the NRC is not, you know, I'll acknowledge that the NRC is not in, you know, in the driver's seat on uh, climate change and energy security in terms of setting domestic or international goals uh, related to those issues. But the NRC still plays an important role in the collective effort to enable success of those policy objectives. And at the very, very least, the NRC must not be a hindrance to uh, that success um, while always uh, maintaining uh, uh, public health and safety first and foremost, we must be enablers. So as we look ahead for the NRC in that, in, in that regard, uh, moving past our current fleet, we must also be prepared to um, efficiently review an increasing number of new license applications for advanced reactors. Many of these reactors um, will use uh, novel fuels and designs that incorporate advanced safety features, um, which is exciting, but is different than what we've had in the past uh, with, that's primarily been light water based. Uh, in doing so, it, it's my view that the NRC must, must take this responsibility on um, within a broader sense of, of purpose for where our agency fits in. Um, I, you know, I, I think our purpose needs to uh, include our specific regulatory function, but uh, in a thoughtful context of, you know, ensuring that facilities are safe, they're cited, they're, the resilience is they're, they're cited in a resilient way, uh, constructed well, and, uh, and 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 can ensure the reliable operation. Um, and we have to work with our federal partners to ensure that that happens. It's no small task. Uh, Interagency coordination is difficult, um, but we need to uh, be mindful of how we fit into the bigger picture. These are big challenges. I welcome them uh, as tremendous opportunities. I think the entire agency should, should see it that way. Um, it's an opportunity to embrace. Um, he didn't say it yesterday, but as my uh, colleague Commissioner Wright uh, is, likes to say, it's time to, to, to meet the moment. We need to be able to uh, be able to do that. The moment is now, um, and so we all got to move together collectively. But the NRC is just one one piece of a bigger puzzle um, that we're all here to help solve today. Uh, we all play a different role in in, in sharing our our, our uh, path to that goal, um, and this includes international cooperation, just not our domestic efforts. Um, uh, cooperation among peaceful nations will uh, uh, benefit us all. Um, and so one thing that the RIC really offers that I have valued is an opportunity to talk to, um, for me and my colleagues, as we talk to our, our counterparts, um, with many of you, we get um, uh, to better understand each other's needs, the progress we've been making, um, an opportunity to identify new opportunities for collaboration. I, I think that the uh, coordination and collaboration of the international community is uh, equally important as our domestic engagements in terms of, of uh, ensuring uh, success for nuclear uh, in the years ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think all of us from our various vantage points know that um, the table today has probably never been better set. Um, for civilian nuclear energy technologies to overcome some of the historic challenges it has faced. Um, the policy and financial incentives, the political alignment, um, public support, a multifaceted geopolitical uh, uh, context with many imperatives therein, um, all are in favor of uh, uh, nuclear uh, as a solution. Um, but that time is now, and it probably is not going to come again. Um, so I think we need to make real progress in the, in the, in the intervening years uh, through the end of this decade. Uh, this is a confluence of policy, politics, and financial support that nuclear energy is, uh, for nuclear energy, that's rare in any policy area, and it's an alignment that's unlikely to ever repeat itself again. So as of today, uh, I have approximately three and a half years remaining on my current term on the commission, uh, or to be exact, 1,204 days. 
I plan to use every one of those to make a difference. Um, to be fair, uh, I would take this approach regardless of the uh, critical point at which nuclear is at. But in the context of my role as an NRC commissioner, I really want to be part of the solution and I want the agency to keep a pace. So what's happened in the 364 days since I last stood before you on this stage? Um, a lot. Um, and I hope that trend continues. Um, my colleagues have already eloquently spoken uh, yesterday about uh, a number of things, uh, recent developments, the construction permit on the uh, Hermes non-power test reactor, Vogel 3 starting commercial operations, which coincided with my birthday, thank you. Uh, Vogel 4, hopefully by the end of this year, uh, in, in the um, sooner rather than later, hopefully, uh, a demonstration project for HALU, um, all our successes since last year's RIC. Um, I don't think um, any of my fellow commissioners nor myself envisioned the leaps and bounds being made in fusion energy in this last year either. Uh, I think that probably goes for all of you in this room, except for those maybe working on fusion. Uh, now, there's still a long way to go on fusion, uh, both technically and economically, but at the current pace of technological advancement and financial investment, fusion energy systems could start giving fission reactors some healthy competition in the next decade. Um, uh, we'll see if that materializes, but I really encourage uh, that as a healthy thing. Uh, the NRC uh, should uh, be proud of the fact that it recognizes these, early, these um, advancements uh, happening in fusion and elsewhere. Um, and for fusion specifically, you know, last spring we uh, directed the NRC staff to create a regulatory framework for fusion energy systems, building on the agency's existing process for licensing the use of byproduct materials. That's going to be a new approach for uh, technologies that generate uh, energy, but I think it's the right one. And um, uh, but it does mean there's a lot to do between now and when that regulation, re re uh, you know, cooperative regulation would start happening. So we need to make sure that we uh, stay on top of it. Uh, like all of you in this room, I've been a longtime energy watcher, um, and I've been excited to see fusion starting to progress so quickly. Um, but it's a hard concept for, uh, to grasp sometimes because of the tremendous potentials it provides. So I've also wanted to see it uh, uh, in person for myself. Um, it's been a long time since my time at DOE, uh, being able to go visit the NIF. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect to go see some of these uh, early stage uh, uh, f fusion uh, startups, and uh, I got a good a good picture of that last August. Um, in fact, Commissioner Wright joined me, and we went to visit Helion and Zap Energy, uh, based near Seattle, Washington. Um, and in a few weeks, I th uh, uh, Ambassador, sometimes I call him Commissioner Wright, uh, will join me again uh, to go to uh, Massachusetts and visit Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Um, uh, I'm the, coincidentally between Washington State and, and Massachusetts, from the uh, agreement state regulatory perspective, these states leading in this area is really important. They have strong uh, state programs and hopefully will set the stage for other agreement states to set up a, a strong regulatory framework for fusion that will enable success. Um, turning back to fission for a quick second, uh, the uh, commission took another step uh, within the last year uh, in optimizing NRC's readiness for a new generation of reactors by approving a final rule establishing emergency preparedness uh, requirements for small modular reactors and other new technologies. Our votes uh, are, of course, public, uh, so you may have seen I did not agree with everything in this rule as adopted, but that's okay. It's healthy, in my mind, to explore different ideas, experiences, opinions, and expertise when talking through issues with my colleagues. The most important thing is that commissioners and their staff communicate with one another on a regular basis, including sharing individual viewpoints, but also listening to and understanding the differing views and unique insights that we each have. There will be disagreements. Some are small, some will be big. But ultimately, I believe that better policies will result when you have a diverse body that engages in true collaboration. So I look forward to continuing that with all of you. Personally, uh, whether I agree or disagree uh, in whole or in part with uh, one of my commission colleagues, uh, I still benefit from the, the forthright collegial discussions that we've been able to have. Um, uh, as a result, I'm able to draft more thoughtful and informed votes, and I, I thank you all for that. 
I also think that this is exactly what Congress intended when establishing the NRC as a commission-led agency versus, uh, designed to formulate policy as a collegial body rather than establishing it with a single administrator. Um, Congress, uh, I think it's, I won't get too much trouble saying this, they probably deserve a lot of heat for a lot of things, but on this one, I think they got it right. Um, uh, and uh, I look forward to that, continuing that and at, at a full complement of five, where at which the uh, commission works best, in my opinion. Speaking of uh, good examples of collaboration, and this was touched on by my colleagues as well, but I can't skip over it. Uh, we marked a significant milestone recently by completing deliberation on uh, the NRC staff's draft rule for advanced reactors, uh, affectionately called Part 53. Uh, reaching this point in development of a modernized regulatory framework for new and advanced reactors has been a long time coming. Though I might add, it's still well ahead of uh, the schedule set by Congress and we're gonna keep a pace. Uh, there were highs and lows, as most of you know, uh, in this process and many bumps in between. Uh, that being said, I'm confident that the proactive approach taken on Part 53 by NRC staff to engage the public was the correct approach. Uh, moving forward, be it in the context of Part 53 or other significant um, uh, uh, rulemakings, I would encourage the NRC staff to make targeted, smart, informed process improvements to how we do that engagement, but while absolutely continuing to employ that, that collaborative model of early and meaningful engagement with all stakeholders. Um, I think it was one part of the result when it came up to the commission level and, and we all started to collaborate and vote that it went very well. I mean, our staffs knocked out most of the issues. Uh, we engaged as principals on a couple and that was, that was really telling um, and, and, a, and a testament to, to the ability of the commission to do big things. Um, two other um, uh, important things that the commission's in the process of advancing, uh, uh, both for new reactors, um, for both for new and advanced reactors and the operating fleet. Um, last week, I voted on a proposed rule to establish the gener a generic environment impact statement for new reactor technologies, which was in, uh, of interest to, to many of you. And uh, again, last week, it was a busy week, uh, uh, has been noted, uh, uh, I voted on a final rule on a complementary generic environmental impact statement specific to license renewal for operating reactors. For each rulemaking, I applaud the staff's efforts in taking the approach of generically addressing certain issues and focusing environmental reviews, review efforts on site-specific issues without shortchanging environmental reviews or, und or undermining our NEPA responsibilities. <clears throat> we will need this kind of novel uh, yet conscientious, conscientious thinking uh, uh, in our approach to the, the many critically important reviews that the NRC does. Um, and it's, uh, uh, I think, a role we could not have necessarily uh, or scenario not necessarily uh, imagined years ago. Uh, I want to express my uh, appreciation to Chair Hansen for his leadership, which uh, comes in many forms, but one area where I'm very uh, appreciative of his proactive um, efforts is um, his tasking of the NRC's general counsel to take a fresh look at um, the, the uh, commission's mandatory hearing process and find ways to um, identify efficiencies for carrying out uh, a requirement that is, uh, uh, is, is a statutory obligation for us. Um, uh, I think uh, Chair Hansen and I and our, and our colleagues believe there are many efficiencies that we can find internally um, to help smooth the process and have it be uh, more appropriate for our, our, our modern day context and in recognition of uh, the experience gained over the years. Uh, You'll hear about more encouraging developments from the NRC staff uh, this week. Um, uh, you probably already have uh, as part of uh, uh, remarks and technical sessions. Um, I hope you're sharing in kind the things that you're doing in, from your respective roles. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done um, and we must continue to make timely progress. I'll now turn to other parts of the fuel cycle for just a few minutes. Um, if any of you have uh, chatted with me before or heard me speak in public, you'll know that I'll never miss an opportunity to discuss both the front and the back end of the fuel cycle. I'm a glutton for punishment, uh, but I firmly believe that it's the NRC's re regulatory decisions will have broader and more durable acceptance if we demonstrate to the public that we are mindful in considering the entire fuel cycle and the opportunities and the challenges therein. Um, 
and you know the, the, the these particularly the front end uh, fuel cycle challenges um, uh, are being exacerbated um, by geopolitics and, and so the invasion of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine has dramatically changed that landscape um, and is uh, forcing a recognition that we probably should have uh, addressed many years ago, but we can do it. Uh, to achieve uh, true energy security, the U.S. must make progress to bolster our domestic uranium milling, conversion, and enrichment capabilities, and we must continue to do so on a timeline commensurate with the progress of new and advanced reactors in this country. This is our chicken and egg dilemma, um, but uh, we need to uh, pursue both in earnest and um, do what we can to make sure that the timing aligns. Um, that being said, it would also it's also my firm belief that um, we must keep an eye on the back end of the fuel cycle. In fact, uh, on the front and the back end of the fuel cycle, I view it as irresponsible to utilize nuclear energy to lower emissions and help address climate change if in doing so we knowingly allow nuclear energy to become the harbinger of new multi-generational threats to our public health, safety, and economy, namely in the form of unmanaged spent fuel and nuclear waste uh, or exacerbating the challenges of nuclear proliferation. Uh, as my colleague, Dr. Katie Huff, put it during congressional testimony earlier this year, the promise of new and advanced reactors can most responsibly be realized in conjunction with progress on the management of their spent nuclear fuel. Personally, I cannot agree more. Um, as the NRC moves forward with research, rulemaking, and licensing of, licensing of new nuclear technologies, energy generation technologies, we must not lose focus on the responsible management or reuse of spent fuel inventories, coupled with the timely advances in nuclear waste storage and disposal strategies. The NRC, again, must keep a pace. We must also be thoughtful about how we successfully manage the decommissioning of all types of facilities. The NRC staff recently delivered the draft final rule for decommissioning reactors to the commission for our consideration. This is an important rule to many of the stakeholders in the room and uh, notably to the communities that have hosted or will host operating nuclear power plants or have questions about issues such as site restoration and, spent, and how spent fuel will be addressed. With this rule, the NRC will establish rules of the road uh, for these sites where it could take decades to complete decommissioning. I'm coming into this, rule, this important rulemaking near the final step, but it has my full attention given its long-term impact. So whether we're talking about abandoned uranium mines, uranium milling, mill tailings, disposal sites, low-level waste disposal facilities, um, the NRC has a shared responsibility to bolster the government's social license with respect to responsibility and proacti proactively managing the back end of the fuel cycle. Um, and uh, in doing so, we need to be conscious and mindful uh, to, of the missteps of the past and not to repeat those mistakes. Um, that is a, a, a basic and obvious obligation uh, as, as public servants, in my opinion. In his remarks yesterday, Chair Hansen also talked about trust being a key component to the NRC's success moving forward. I agree wholeheartedly. He and I have had many conversations on this topic. But as he knows and I know, uh, trust must first be earned and then carefully maintained. And although the table right now uh, broadly appears to be set for success from a policy and political perspective for nuclear, I don't see a nuclear renaissance in the United States taking hold without commensurate trust from the public that the NRC, and truly all of us, not just the NRC, uh, uh, is doing what's in the people's best interest. Public trust and engagement are precursors to everything we hope to achieve as an agency. During my career in public service at both the state and the federal level, I've been reminded time and time again that nuclear issues always garner significant public interest. As such, the proactive community engagement must always be an early priority. Uh, I've engaged in many conversations and heard from numerous stakeholders over the last year and a half about licensing and regulatory efficiency. And rightfully so, these are important things. Uh, but in my mind, uh, in addition to the standard definition of what we think about efficiency from a public agency perspective, efficiency also means that everyone, public citizens, state governments, tribal governments, industry and beyond, are entitled to a fully transparent and accessible nuclear regulatory framework and associated licensing and oversight. Procedural justice for everyone is essential. And taking time on the front end to educate and build relationships with local stakeholders will ultimately re result in more efficiency than attempting to skip that vital step. 
uh, as I read recently uh, in the press, uh, former NRC chair Dale Klein recently said, quote, trust is hard to gain, but easy to lose. And again, I could not agree, agree more with that sentiment. Uh, we mu must put in the work uh, with the public. Uh, doing so will form the foundation for the public to have confidence in the regulatory process. Unfortunately, this challenge also comes uh, at a difficult time, uh, given for the NRC and all uh, federal and, and other government agencies. Um, whether fair or not, Americans are increasingly losing faith in their government. Um, there's polls from uh, late last year that found 44% of Americans have a great deal to fair amount of trust in the federal government to handle international problems. Uh, even fewer, 37%, have a great deal to fair amount of trust in the federal government to handle domestic issues. That's what the same political terms as being underwater. Uh, we need to improve upon that. Since the NRC works on issues in both arenas, we've got some serious work to do, but we're not alone. Uh, in my view, it's incumbent upon all of all of us, all public officials, to work to reverse this trend uh, through our daily actions uh, by maintaining the highest standards of accountability and active engagement with the public who we ultimately serve. Uh, as Commissioner Wright suggested in his speech uh, yesterday, every NRC employee is an ambassador representing our mission, our service, and what we value. He's right. And I also believe that every NRC employee should help communicate what it is that we do and why it's important. Uh, and uh, for our recruiting and hiring managers, I actually think that uh, they should use Commissioner Wright's video as a recruiting tool. It would, uh, it would be the envy of the CIA if you've seen those commercials. Um, in all seriousness, uh, the why Commissioner Wright's video may have been entertaining, it was also effective because it told a part of the NRC experience in terms anyone could understand and appreciate. That is exactly how the NRC needs to introduce or reintroduce itself to the public by engaging stakeholders at their level, using plain language and real world context. Explaining nuclear power and other nuclear applications, not to mention the regulatory role of the NRC to average folks, is challenging. Uh, personally, I will seek out opportunities to explain exactly what I do as a NRC commissioner to my family, friends, and neighbors, occasionally to an Uber driver. Uh, it's not always easy, but usually if I take a moment to uh, assess my audience, I can find a way to connect. Um, uh, I believe we all have a responsibility to do this in our respective roles and our daily lives, um, but particularly those of us in public service. I don't believe it's the uh, public's responsibility to understand nuclear physics. I view it as the NRC's responsibility to explain um, our job uh, in ensuring the peaceful application of nuclear technologies to the public in a manner that they can understand. I know there are lots of smart people in this room, and the NRC has some of the smartest people I've met in my career. But as uh, Albert Einstein uh, said, and I think his birthday's tomorrow, which is always convenient for the rink, um, if you quote, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. I think that's true as well. Um, we gotta be able to reach a broad audience by explaining things in everyday terms. So I issue that challenge to all of you, uh, especially if you're an NRC employee. Engage with your friends and neighbors, especially the younger generation. Um, tell them what you do and why it's important. Um, if they understand, then you've succeeded uh, in, in that instance. But if not, keep trying. I've failed many times and have refined uh, how I discuss these things. Um, and it's important to be able to do that. Um, and this, by having those small conversations, uh, the seeds you sow with them will, will sprout tomorrow and there'll be a benefit to all of us. But all of the successes that uh, we've had at the NRC and hope to continue to have and our preparations for um, a bright future for the safe application of nuclear uh, technologies won't be possible um, without the NRC staff, the people power that we use to do these things. Um, we've talked about this in, in numerous times already this week, but um, you know, the NRC particularly needs to retain the amazing experts that we have had at the agency for so long, uh, but do so while preparing and recruiting a new generation to work with us and transferring that knowledge um, to have continuity. Um, engineers, scientists, operators, security specialists, trades and crafts, attorneys, administrative support, everything in between, we need it all. 
and I'm concerned uh, with that hill that we have to climb. Um, our experts in all things nuclear related are also increasingly retirement eligible. Um, so, and on the other end of the career spectrum for uh, young professionals, there's uh, reason to be concerned about how we will refill the a very limited talent pool. Uh, earlier this year, a survey of 34 universities with nuclear engineer programs found that the overall number of nuclear engineering degrees awarded in 2021 and 22 were at their lowest levels in more than a decade. And data on crafts and trades is not encouraging either, with less than 9% of workers aged 19 to 24 entering the trades. Trends like this fuel my continued concern. But from a micro perspective and somewhat anecdotally, I will say that I'm, I am encouraged at the same time when I talk to students and visit universities. And I think uh, many of my colleagues have had the same experience. Um, Last year, I was uh, able to spend time with students at the ANS chapter at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, and with their faculty advisors. And um, the amount of talent and smarts and enthusiasm in that room uh, were, were, were overwhelming. And it made me feel uh, insufficient in terms of like, how do I bottle that up and direct you towards the NRC, or if not the NRC, in the space that will um, uh, help uh, address our, our, all of our issues, the big issues that we need to do today. Um, uh, at, at some point, uh, Ray, you and your, your leadership will have to give uh, all of the commissioners a uh, easy, like, here's your route from school to working for the NRC, uh, and not just for lawyers, but for the technical folks, um, so we can uh, be good ambassadors when we're out on the road. Um, uh, so let's all do our part to keep, uh, 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 you know, making that pool of, of, of the workforce that we need so desperately continue to grow. Um, the NRC, in this context, the NRC's got some uh, uh, high bar hiring goals. Uh, we've got some real challenges. Um, but we're, we're pushing hard to do it. Our hiring targets account for attrition. Um, we've had two, uh, as we too have had a workforce that is increasingly retirement eligible and our talent is being heavily recruited by others and uh, who need the skills and expertise. Uh, and let's be honest, uh, others who can often uh, compensate better than the federal government can. Uh, I don't begrudge any of you for going out and getting the best talent you can, um, but the NRC uh, needs to do the same and we can offer something uh, intangible that uh, a salary cannot, which is the uh, opportunity to see a part of the process and be part of uh, 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 advancing the public good in a, in a way that you can look back and say you were part of doing big things. Um, we really need to sell the value of, of public service and the unique uh, opportunities at the NRC. It is a special place to work, um, and we should recognize that by using it as a recruiting tool. Um, the, uh, so, you know, to all of our current NRC staff, thank you for everything that you, uh, uh, for who you are and everything that you do. Um, Change is always challenging, but it's always good as well. Um, and we've had a lot of it, and we will continue to have a lot of it. Um, I implore you not to be discouraged, but to look at it as, a, as an opportunity uh, to build your own career and uh, make the agency a better place. Um, I want all of NRC's employees to continue uh, to find new strategies for engaging, the commu engaging and communicating with all of our stakeholders. Um, we need you, your expertise, and your mentoring of the next generation of NRC employees. Every day I come to the office, I'm humbled uh, to work with you, and I'm awed by the accomplishments you've made in very difficult areas. Um, I want everyone in the NRC workforce to feel like you are part of a generational opportunity to make lasting change. We're all in this together. I also want to acknowledge the incredibly important work and the role of the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, or ACRS which, put simply, and I think everyone in this room probably knows this, is the NRC's technical conscience and plays a vital, independent, indispensable oversight role in the social license framework. Any time that I'm preparing a vote on a matter that ACRS has reviewed in full or in part, I want to know what they've said. I value their expertise, their outside of the building look at safety-related issues, and the informed opinions about the staff's work. As a commission formulates policy in areas never before considered in many cases, I want to know our advisory committee's views on these new technologies 
and how the NRC is setting expectations and frameworks for their safe use. In recent years, the utility of the advisory committee has been called into question. Everyone under the NRC umbrella, including the ACRS, is seeking to keep a pace and prepare for the myriad uh, of workload scenarios that we face. The advisory committee is also adapting to its role uh, and, it's, and, and, and they're doing so is critical to our success. Uh, I've talked to the um, current chair of ACRS and they understand that they need to refine and improve their process as well. So there's strong recognition um, of what is before all of us and now we need to put those things in motion. So thank you all uh, for the role you play in making, uh, turning opportunities into reality. Um, thank you for indulging me for this long uh, and to share my perspectives and uh, I will wrap it up so I can move on to my favorite part of these uh, engagements, which is Q&A. So thank you all. Um, and Andrea, I'm ready for the hot seat. All right, we've got about four minutes. So I, I went on for that long? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm going to start right in. Yeah. Okay. So in your speech, you talked about building um, public confidence and maintaining that confidence. And that is critical for nuclear to become a viable source of energy. What would you say if it applies or how it applies to nuclear waste and also the back end of the fuel cycle? It's as if not more important on the, on the front and the back end of the fuel cycle. I mean, we have a pretty clear, stark example on the back end where failure to do proactive engagement resulted in a serious impediment to making progress on, uh, on storage of spent fuel. So, uh, you know, we got to recognize that, not repeat it. You know, the NRC's role is obviously on the latter end of, of, of that uh, uh, topic, but um, we still have a role to play there. And uh, you know, what the NRC is doing now in regards to some of the interim storage uh, projects, um, the, the same theories apply there. Uh, and what we're doing in looking at uh, front end milling, mining, and things like that um, are also very uh, real and call for that kind of engagement um, in a way that uh, perhaps wasn't done well in the past. Okay, next question. If risk insights and risk-related information are to be integral to the future of expediting various licensing processes, how do you ensure that NRC management and staff, as well as the industry, have an aligned understanding of these processes so that implementation is consistently gaining efficiencies while maintaining a balanced focus on public health and safety? That is a, that is a SAT style yes, question. Well, wow. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'll try to answer it briefly since we're short on time, but there needs to be consistency throughout the agency and how we engage. There needs to be management accountability for um, engaging in ways that are going to be more efficient while upholding our, our safety case. Um, and this is why we're, uh, you know, we have an organization with various levels of leadership and they all need to play their role. Um, but I would say that the, um, you know, our mid-level employees and entry-level employees need to give feedback up too if they're hearing contrary or contradictory uh, direction. Um, so I think consistency and accountability, um, while it may sound boring, uh, are essential for uh, an agency as large uh, and as complex as NRC is. And you must be clairvoyant because you covered the next question and your answer, so I'm going to skip to the last question, which is how can the NRC recruit and retain more young people? Uh, two, two ways in the 30 seconds we have here. Um, do our part in fueling the, uh, the talent pool from our university grant programs and things like that. Uh, being innovative and modernizing the way we recruit and hire and joining with partners um, uh, domestically and internationally um, that are 
doing workforce efforts. I know uh, our friend uh, uh, DG Magwood is here and he uh, um, is doing a lot of good things in that regard at NEA and we can learn from it as well as some of our partner countries are doing a great job um, building their talent pool and recruiting them. So um, we could uh, stand to learn and benefit from those efforts. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. No, I think we have a couple seconds, but not enough for another question. So. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. I'll drop this off because I come right back. Okay.